Good morning, I'm very pleased to meet you. It's a genuine pleasure. As I have told you, you are the first individual in science who has ever been interested in my part of the streptomyces story. I will convey to you as much information as I can and answer your questions as best I can. Please do not hesitate to ask. So, I wrote a song for you, which I think uh, really says who you are. He finds it a thrill from the top of a hill to talk to the view with an echo and laugh through a tale of a ride on a whale while balancing waves on his shoulder. He can always be found on his merry-go-round. He's a child love who's never grown older. You have expressions and your tone of humor totally reminds me of Albert. And I know it's yours and it's not Albert's, I don't mean to offend you, but you have some very, very interesting Albert traits that just crack me up when I see them. Look into his eyes, they'll quiet your sighs, help you forget your sorrows. He'll quiet your fears as you laugh through your tears. He'll give you hope for tomorrow. He can always be found on his merry-go-round. He's a child love who's never grown older. I met Albert in a very interesting way. The phone rang and I was the only one there, so I went to answer the phone. And here was this man saying, is Ann Ida Robinson there? I said, no, she's not here. He said, well, I wanted to go walking with her. Do you want to go walking? I said, oh, sure, I'd love to go walking. And I said, I want to go to the lilac gardens, which was about two miles away. 
because I'd been to the lilac gardens that week and it was just so wonderful to smell all the lilacs. And he was so funny. I just laughed. It was just great. He had such a wonderful sense of humor. That semester, Albert and I took a course, on my, a mycology course, with Dr. Hellier. We took it together. And Dr. Hellier was wonderful. We were always out in the woods, turning, turning logs over, finding mushrooms, bringing them back to identify. This, is, this, this would be our night out. Listen to this. Some Saturday nights, Albert would have um, inoculated Petri dishes with a lot of a certain kind of penicillium, for example. And we would sit there <laughs> identifying the different kinds of penicillium. You can see the window um, <clears throat> where your grandmother used to come and knock on the window and say, and come and do her homework with Albert. And in the basement of that administration building, that was the laboratory uh, where Albert actually discovered the strain of streptomycin. It's not like it used to look like. It's turned into something else. Um, it's a now a sort of museum uh, to basically a museum to Salmon Waxman. I didn't go down to see it the day they celebrated opening that lab because they had changed it and it was going to be a Waxman lab. <laughs> so Waxman never was down in that lab. He was up on the third floor. This is um, the first of the notebooks. This isn't the big. This isn't the main one. I just thought I'd show you the first one. Yeah. Uh, this was from 1942. Um, and this is when he first started. Yeah. Yeah. Notes. By the time your grandfather, by the time Al became interested in working on um, streptomycin, on discovering new antibiotics uh, which could cure TB, there was no cure. It was still the big killer disease. A young, super dedicated scientist in his very early years devoted his life to finding a cure found the cure, and saved possibly hundreds of millions of people's lives. I talked to my dad uh, many times about his discovery when I was an adult, and he was always happy to talk about it. And I had a question for him. How did you feel when you discovered streptomycin, when you saw two test tubes where the streptomycin was inhibiting the growth of the tuberculosis? And he said he was tired. And I thought he'd feel elated. He'd be so excited. Oh, look, it's, it's inhibiting this. But no, he said he was tired. And I know he'd been working day and night and day and night for months to find something. He was determined to find it. The famous one uh, is, let's see. See, so they have different numbering systems. There's this. This is the second notebook. And it started out in 1943. Oh, there we go. That's the experiment. Experiment 11. Experiment 11 is the story uh, of a student and a professor, where the student makes an enormous discovery in medicine, and the professor, little by little, takes this discovery away from the student and makes it his own. Then the way Peter 
figured out that those notebooks have to exist. Albert got a PhD, he had to have notebooks, where are they? None of the other people that did extensive, that did research, not as extensive as Peter did, none of them thought, where are the notebooks? And none of them were determined, like Peter was, to find the notebooks. And it was um, like seeing an original document. Um, and um, it was like being, it must have been like being allowed if you, you know, the clergy always used to be in charge of the illuminated manuscripts, right? You can't actually see it. I'll tell you what's in it because you're not an important person. Um, so you never actually get to see it. But when you actually get to hold the thing in your hand and it is the genuine document, then it's, it's a real pleasure. I remember now that's when I cried. That's what I was trying to remember. That you being that close to Albert's discovery to him writing that out. It's like I can't wait to see those. I don't know if I'm allowed to touch him for acid and stuff, you know, these days, even though it's my dad's notebooks, they're still for history now. And but just to lay my eyes on the original ones. Feathery line with paints that he made at the river. 